feel really attractive. Oh, it's also another house today. <coughs> hey, fever in it. Hello. Who's here? Oh, splendid. Hello. Oh, and people, you're liking. Thank you. That's always very nice. Right. Got my sugar. Uh, oh, I should have said, you might want to bring a wine glass as well. Just quickly go and grab one. Put like a thumb full of water in the wine glass. I think a lot of you would have done this before. Some of the best activities in this class. Okay, right. Uh, let's go for it. Let's just do this. I'm going to flip you. I am flipping you. You ready? My name is Lara and this is the show where I tell you everything I've learned about a thing this week and Science Alliance. The thing I've been learning about is frogs. I'm very excited. I'm going to do something that we don't normally do. We'll just go straight to story time because frogs are amphibians. I didn't really know what that meant. So we're just going to do a story time about what amphibians are and then we can carry on learning about frogs. Okay, right. Let's, let's just do this. Let's go. Uh, you go down. Uh, nice. Oops. That's better. Let's get this down here. Okay, you ready? Story time. <coughs> 2022 mammals. You know, the furry ones that grow their babies inside their bodies. They rule the world. Woo! Uh, and we all know that 66 to 200 million-ish years ago, reptiles, the ones that generally lay eggs and can change the temperature of their blood, they ruled the world. But what came before the reptiles? Eh? We don't talk about that, do we? Well, to talk about what came before reptiles, we got to go deep. We've got to go deeper than we've ever been before in theatre of science. We've got to push ourselves to the very limits of what we find interesting. We've got to talk about fish nostrils. Yep, it's true. Sound boring? Well, uh, yeah, it might be. So we'll, we'll try and do it quickly. Fish, they breathe through their gills, yeah? So why do they have nostrils? Well, it turns out fish are really, really good at smelling things. Yeah, they've got nostrils so that they can smell. Um, they're really good at smelling things. We, we should have known this really because we know that if you dangle stuff into water, then the fish will smell it and come towards it. So what is happening is that fish have actually got four nostrils. So they've got two front nostrils and two back nostrils and particles dissolved in water go through the first nostrils, get detected and then come out through the back nostrils, right? The second nostrils. And that's how fish smell things. So uh, breathe, close your mouth, please. Close your mouth and breathe in now. Keep your mouth closed and breathe out again. You can breathe through your nose without using your mouth. Ooh, fish can't breathe through their noses, okay? That's not how their noses work. Fish use their noses only for smelling things. So what's happening when you breathe <coughs> excuse me, and when all animals with four limbs breathe, is that particles from the air are going into your nose and then travelling along through internal, nostril, no, internal nostrils, which are connected to your windpipe, and then into your lungs and then out again. That's how you breathe through your nose. Yeah, you've got two more nostrils than you thought you had hidden inside your body. This is going okay, isn't it? I give this like eight out of 10 for interesting. So 400 million years ago, fish can't breathe using their nostrils. Or can they enter eusthenopteron? Here they are. So it has developed internal nostrils because they allow it to pull water into their nostrils. Uh, and into their mouth without having to swim, okay? So it allows it to smell, basically, without having to swim. So internal nostrils are very good for smelling while not swimming, but they also happen to be very good for breathing on land. And this is the amazing thing about Euthanopteron. It's accidentally good at living on land 
in loads of ways. Like it's got a little bit of a neck, which is good for finding uh, food on land where water can't just carry things into your mouth. Um, it's got six long bones in its fins, which would be very good for walking on land. It's even got teeth, which are quite good for eating on land, but it doesn't live on land. In other words, it's got a lot of um, exaptations. This is a new word that I just learned. An exaptation is like a way that an animal or plant or whatever is adapted for one thing, but it makes it accidentally good at doing other things. So Euthanoptron got a lot of exaptations that just happen to make it good for living on land. Here's a picture of the real thing. <laughs> I mean... You can see why they didn't slap it on a lunchbox. Like, no one's going to use the Nocturon Park. But it was very important, okay? Because this and other, like, lobe-finned fish, they're called, similar fish, evolved into the first animals with backbones to set fin on land. Which is why we found fossils like this, lass. This is Ichthyostega. Ichthyostega, we reckon, could have been about one and a half metres long, very fish-like head, but also had lungs, and legs powerful enough to drag itself through shallow water and even, like, hump itself onto the land, like seals do. So very soon, this Ichthyostega guy, uh, we, after that we see the first four-limbed animals walking on land, and they are... They're amphibians! So they can walk on land, they can breathe air, but they can't stay on the land for very long because they're still having their babies in water. Like they're amphibians, so they're babies still born with gills and have to swim around and eat their food in water. And then only when they're teenagers do they develop lungs. Um, and for tens of millions of years, these amphibians rule the planet. Like, like this one. Isn't that something so sort of cute about this thing? This is Mastodonosaurus. So they were giant. This was like a six metre long crocodile-like amphibian. But there's more than one of it. Here's an actual kind of illustration of it. They reckon the tail was really long. Um, and if you were wondering what it was like to swim with a giant frog, then here's a helpful illustration that someone has done. So being an amphibian is pretty good, right? But the only thing better than being an amphibian, possibly, is being able to lay your eggs on land. If you could lay your eggs on land, they'd be less likely to get eaten by fish or other amphibians, and they, uh, babies would be a little bit more developed before they got out of the egg, and there's loads of plants on land at this point, so you'd be able to travel further and, and um, eat these lovely plants and not have to worry about your babies being in water. So eventually, some animals do evolve to lay eggs that are covered in like a little membrane so they, they don't dry out. Totally amazing and it's a, it's a revolution and these animals evolve into reptiles. And the amphibian's reign was over, or was it? Uh, well, yeah, it, it was, definitely. In fact, amphibia is now one of the most, well, the most endangered uh, class of animals on the planet, we think, but Without them, there would have been no dinosaurs. So next time you're lucky enough to meet a frog, try and show a little respect. The end. Except for this legal stuff. Thank you, Beckdeezy, for giving me all the beautiful free pictures for that story time. Okay, come up here, you lot. So that's what an amphibian is. Look. Yeah, so an amphibian is, it's just, they're just so odd, aren't they? Like they, they lay their eggs in water, so their babies are born in water, like tadpoles have got little gills, and then as they grow, when they get to about teenagers, usually uh, amphibians develop lungs and breathe on land. So they've got slimy skin, because another way they breathe is oxygen just kind of going into their bodies. Like oxygen has to dissolve in the sort of liquid on their bodies in order to get in. And frogs, it's really important that frogs breathe through their bodies because they hibernate at the bottom of ponds. But they breathe air, but they hibernate under the water. So their oxygen from the water just has to go into their skin. So there's a few different kinds of amphibians. Let's just show you some pictures. So we can clear up kind of what a frog is not. We've got salamanders. Salamanders are 
amphibians that have tails. Essentially, even when they grow up, they've still got tails. So a newt is a salamander and an ashalot, which we've done a show on, is a salamander. And then you've got these guys, Sicilians, which are worms that live under the ground. People don't know a lot about them. Their babies actually are born inside their bodies and eat by scraping off the lining of the body. We'll have to do a show on those. But frogs are kind of salamanders that don't have tails, essentially. So there you go. Toads are just another kind of frog. Toads are a frog that happens to have bumpy skin and be able to and be a bit drier, live in drier conditions, and sometimes has poisons that seep through its body. But yeah, a toad, just a kind of frog. I did not know this. So if you've got a wine glass, if you can grab a wine glass uh, from your cupboards and pour a little drop of water in it, let's talk briefly about how frogs make noises, all right? So if you've never done this activity before, I'm so happy that I get to be the one to show it with you. Let's see if I can tilt this camera a bit without dropping my phone on the floor. Here we go. You just put a little bit of water on your finger and then you run your finger around the edge of a wine glass. And it does take a bit of doing. The first time I did this lesson on Saturday, this didn't work. There you go. Isn't that beautiful? It helps if you go like around the outside and don't have your finger too wet and don't have it too dry. I think that's as good as I'm going to get. Sometimes it... Oh, there we go. It's lovely, isn't it? So how... What essentially is working, is happening there, is that you're sort of pulling the particles of glass and then letting them go as you run your finger around the glass so they're all bumping into each other and they're vibrating and they're vibrating the air and that's what sound is it's just air vibrating but the inside of the glass is kind of acting like a resonating chamber and the sound particles will bounce the sound waves are bouncing around inside the glass and like amplifying the noise right making it louder so you might have seen pictures of frogs with essentially this sort of resonating chamber like stuck to the front of their bodies look here's one so this chat will be making an extremely loud noise doing this. And thank you, um, Julian Alper on Wikipedia. Look, they've got one where the little uh, air sac, it's called, is totally down. And then it goes, we get, and then it goes, we get, and then it comes out again. So frogs make a lot of noise. They're quite famous for making a lot of noise, especially in the rainforest. It's the male frog making that noise, pumping up that air sac and getting the sound waves vibrating so it can be really loud because it needs to... Uh, be heard by the females and it's the female's job to work out who is making the noise so frogs all make slightly different noises because there's no point a bullfrog making a certain noise and a tree frog finding it and being like oh, this is awkward we can't have babies so how it works is and this is just beautiful and amazing well let's do the activity let's do the activity let's talk about how frogs hear and then i'll tell you how it all comes together, how their hearing is related to how they find each other. So this is how humans hear. We've got a big flappy outer ear and then a little tube right leading to an eardrum, just kind of a membrane that vibrates and sends signals to our brain. That's how we hear. Um, frogs don't have this outer ear, obviously, because they want to swim. So it'd be a bit weird having these flappy things. And also frogs have to hear in water and out of water. You might have noticed in a swimming pool, humans not very good at hearing in water. So the frog doesn't have this outer ear at all. It starts with the eardrum. You ever notice this? You can't unsee it once you see it. Look, this round bit just behind a frog's eye, that's its eardrum. Pretty good, eh? So let's make one of those. If you brought a bowl and I said a plastic bag, I don't know if this is a household object anymore. You don't have a plastic bag at home. It's just got to be thin plastic and the plastic's got to go completely over the bowl. So if you've only got like maybe a little thin piece of plastic from some vegetables that you bought or something, you could stretch it over a mug. But if you've got a plastic bag, you need to put the bowl inside the plastic bag and then pull really tight. Yeah, if you haven't got a plastic bag, well done you! You'll have to use a smaller bit of plastic and a smaller, a smaller bowl, it'll still work. So, make a drum, basically. Oh, so satisfying. And what we, so this is like acting like your eardrum, which is, for us, is inside here, and for the frog, it's on the back of their head. And sound waves hit the eardrum, and the eardrum vibrates. You can actually see this if you put a tiny little bit of sugar on top of your eardrum, not too much. And then what you have to do is, 
sort of sing into the eardrum. Don't blow, because that'll just blow the sugar off. You don't want to do that. You want to kind of blow onto it. And you should see the sugar particles vibrating. Try and do a low noise and a high noise and see if it looks different. I'm just going to be mortifying and do it here. See if, I, see if you can see these moving. Ready? Dude. No, it's just blowing, wasn't it? Do, 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 do. There you go. Did I mention don't do it too close to your expensive laptop? Don't do it too close to your expensive laptop. You make it too sugary. But yeah, isn't that great? So that's how eardrums work. That's how the frog's eardrum works. Now, for a long time, we couldn't work out why the frog's eardrum was connected to its lungs. Our eardrums are not connected to our lungs. Not a useful relationship between the eardrum and the lungs. But frogs are. And then we worked it out. It's because when frogs inflate their lungs, they can only detect certain vibrations. So if you imagine that you're in a cafe and it's really busy and there's loads of people and your friend's calling to you, but you can't see them because they're far away and you can't hear them because it's too noisy. It's like, imagine your friend's got a really high voice. When you take a really deep breath in, you, your lungs only vibrate when they hear loud noises. It's like that. So suddenly your lungs are making it that all the low voices get quieter and you can only hear high voices. So it'd be really much easier to find out where your friend was. This is what frogs are doing. All the noises they make are slightly different. So a tree frog, the noise that the male tree frog makes, the female tree frog puffs up her lungs and suddenly she can hear it. Isn't that amazing? Frogs! Who knew they were so cool? Um, so... Oh yeah, before we get off the noise thing then, frogs are loud. There's a Puerto Rican frog in Hawaii that is making houses in Hawaii cost less because no one wants to live there because the frog is so loud. It's a hundred decibels. It's the same as standing about 300 meters away from a jet engine, a jet aeroplane, or like, you know, those jackhammers that break up concrete roads. It's like standing next to one of those. So I don't know, just Puerto Rican frog, I really want to meet you, but, but only very briefly. Okay, let's talk quickly about their breathing, because I showed you the air sac on the front of the body. But you, if you've ever seen a frog, you will notice that it's kind of pumping, pumping all the time, and it's not necessarily making a noise. What's going on there? Well, let me introduce you to something called buckle pumping. Sounds rude, but it's not. It's like this. Thank you, Wikipedia. So um, this is the frog's buckle cavity, this space here just inside its head, and it moves it outwards. And so that makes a space. So air goes in, like oxygenated air, um, but also any carbon dioxide air that it's got in its lungs, that moves in as well, right, into this space. And then when the buccal cavity gets squeezed, brilliantly, because physics and chemistry the oxygen air goes into the lungs and the carbon dioxide air goes out. It says here there's some mixing, but there's not that much mixing. There's not enough mixing to make it worth the frog evolving to do anything else. It can survive that way. Isn't that great? If you've still got your water, you can kind of do some buckle pumping with your hand. Like wet the palm of your hand and then do some squeezes. See if you can make a rude noise. I love doing this. Have you ever been in a paddling pool or swimming pool or a bath? Right, so it's kind, of, it's kind of buckle pumping. What you're doing is you're making a space inside your hands so air is getting in and then you're squeezing the air out, right? So it's basically how frogs breathe. That's why it's going boop, boop, boop. Now, we are getting to the point where I was going to take you down to my pond and show you the frogs that I love it. I just dug a new pond and literally hours after I built it, five frogs were there just like sunning themselves, sitting on the little stones. And the... Anyway, they've all disappeared. So one thing I've learned about frogs this week is that uh, lots of animals enjoy eating them. I think probably rats and maybe a heron, maybe just rats have carried off my frogs, uh, which is extremely sad. I'll probably, I'll go down anyway, because you know, you've got to be optimistic about these things. I did find one the other day. So I'll finish the show by going down and just seeing if there's any frogs there. But I thought we couldn't finish the show without me telling you about poison dart frogs because everyone loves poison dart frogs, right? Have a look at these guys. Here's one. Here's another one. Here's another one. Aren't they gorgeous? So these are poison dart frogs. I always thought, I always thought they were called poison dart frogs because they were a bit pointy like darts. But no, it's because the people who were living in America ages ago before uh, the Europeans invaded, they used to put the poison from the poison dart frogs 
uh, onto their darts so that they could kill people. I know. So they're all different colours to say to people, well, and other animals, stay away, I am very poisonous, do not eat me. Although some of them actually aren't really poisonous, they're just doing it to pretend uh, it works. Some of them are very poisonous. The golden dart frog, I think, has enough poison in its body to kill 20 humans. So stay away. They are gorgeous though, aren't they? Huh. Um, yeah, so I was going to do this bit down by the pond, but it might, it might be too depressing for words. So very quickly, they have got eyes that stick out and that's so that they can see behind them without having to turn their heads. It's nice, isn't it? They can almost see 360 degrees. Um, in the UK, there is the common frog, which is still declining because a lot of people are taking their ponds away um, and they need to move from pond to pond. But the common frog is the most common. It can be so many different patterns. Basically, Google frogs of the UK, look them up on the internet. And if it's not any of the others, then it's a common frog because they can be stripy, spotty, yellow, black, brown, beautiful things. Um, there's a pool frog, it's not funny, there's a pool frog in the UK uh, that its numbers were dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping and in about 1995 the last pool frog died in the UK about the same time that we realised that they were native to the UK, they'd always been in the UK and that we should be protecting them. Like, oh that frog's gone, wait, oh no, oh no, God, oh, no has anyone got a pool frog? So they had to reintroduce them. Um, and there's an edible frog in the UK, which I think is like a mixture of those two frogs uh, put together, um, called edible frogs because they get eaten. And there's a bullfrog. If, you, if you're ever in the British Isles and you see a frog that is like 25 centimetres big, it's a bullfrog. It's not really supposed to be here. I think it was brought over from America as a pet and someone, people didn't want them, so they just tip the tadpoles into rivers and ponds, and now it's kind of taking over and eating everything else. If you see a massive frog, you have to report it to your authorities, because they're trying to get rid of them. Okay, that is the end of the show. I will do my ad, and then I'll sneak down to the pond, just so that we can see if there's any there. Even though there were be. If you are enjoying these shows, you can support me and get nice things. I do a show with a Lego story time like this. Uh, every week, apart from when it's York holiday time, because I'm looking after my children. And I do a home ed show as well, which you can come to. There's one very soon at 11 o'clock on Facebook. Uh, if you want to pay me £5 a month, that is all I need in order for this to be my job. Enough people are paying me £5 a month that, uh, that yeah, I can, I can do all this cool stuff. So if you sign up, I'll be ever so grateful and I'll send you Theatre of Science magazine. This is the rainforest issue, which you will get when you sign up now. It's got a craft at the back. You can make your own rainforest beetles and mount them. Um, it's got a choose your own adventure quiz. Will you die in the rainforest or will your knowledge save you? It's got a comic, which my husband illustrates beautifully, about an insect expert, which you should all know about. I'm very proud of Theatre of Science magazine. It comes out every two months and the next one is going to be on seeds. It's going to be a bit of a bumper summer issue. Um, so if you sign up now, you'll be getting that in summer. I'll send you some rainbow glasses, because they make you see rainbows. They're amazing. Oh, they're so awesome. I won't show you, you'll have to sign up. Um, and yeah, if you, if you send me six pounds a month, I'll send you some badges as well. I'm just very grateful. This is definitely the best job I could ever imagine having. Okay, very quickly, I'll go onto Facebook and see if anyone has left me any messages. And then we will go and not find frogs in my pond. But you gotta try, you gotta be positive. On Saturday I went down there, no, Monday night, it's like, guys, let's go and not see any frogs. And then I turned the camera off, turned around, and a frog was just darting behind a stone. So I had to turn the camera back on again. Cool story, Lara. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I'm just getting time because I'm trying to get to your comments. Because uh, there's no comment stream, obviously, on the YouTube video. But if you go to my Facebook page, there is, I always put a little post up there where you can leave some comments. So if you've got any questions about frogs, if you're like, Lara, where did you get that frog costume? It's so high rent, I need one. Oh, hello, who's this? Is this? Oh, Patricia Young is going to get frogs. Patricia and Co. Yes, are you? How do you get frogs? It's difficult. I was worried that, I think if you build the pond, they'll just come, won't they? That's what it is. If you build the pond, they'll come. Hey! Suki and Eunice, hello. Where's Arza? Are they okay? I hope so. Well, hello Suki and Eunice. Hopefully Arza's is just off having fun. Oh, hello Laurie. Oh, good to see you. Laurie, hello. Splendid. All right, let's go down to my pond. <laughs> I can't do a frog show and not at least have a look in the pond. Just in case. I, I, 
I was sad, but I told myself, well, if we'd been doing a show about rats or heavens, then we'd be really excited, right? To see them. To see them munching down on some frogs. Like, all animals gotta live. Just not, right, okay. No, it tends to, uh, it tends to go off. So, if I get a little bit close, you might be able to see it's teeny tiny cutting. That is to do with the buckle pumping. It's got to, um, block off its nostrils. So that when it, I think it's blocking them off, so that when it opens the cavity, maybe that's where the air is going through. Anyway. No. Oh, love it. Don't go in. You can look it up if you want to know the intricate details of buckle pumping, but the nostrils need to shut and open. 